we have to combine meditation with sleep. And I hinted at that last week. I said a good state of meditation was mind awake, but body asleep. And they've done studies with meditation, like actual uh, clinical studies, and they take people who can meditate and they hook them up to like uh, EEG and electroencephalograms and measure their heart rate and their brain waves and that kind of stuff. And they've discovered that a deep state of meditation, physiologically, is actually quite similar to sleep. Okay, and that's one of the things that we're trying to achieve. And I don't, I don't know why. I'd studied a lot of meditation in many different areas, many different schools. I paid all kinds of money to learn how to meditate. And for some reason, nobody came out and said that to me. So I didn't realize that's what we were trying to do. Remember we talked about the five phases of meditation last week? And the first phase that we talked about was always the relaxation of the physical body. And I spent so much time talking about relaxation, relaxation, relaxation. That's why. The relaxation and the breathing are important because that's what's going to put your body in that sleep state. Because what happens when we go to sleep? Do you remember? When we go to sleep every night, what is it that happens? Which is what, what's that, what's dreaming? What do we define dreaming as? What are we what are we doing when we're dreaming? Where are we when we're dreaming? Yeah. Remember that's part of the physiological process of our body. When our physical body falls asleep, our consciousness unfolds or transfers into the astral body. It's like taking the car in the garage to get fixed and coming out with a motorcycle. We switch vehicles at night while we sleep. So what we're trying to do with meditation is the same thing. Allow the physical body to fall asleep, but the consciousness is going to stay awake. So when that unfoldment process happens, we're aware of it. So we find ourselves in the higher dimensions, but placed there consciously, as opposed to our regular night's sleep when we end up in the higher dimensions, but we're under control of the ego. We go there unconsciously. So what we're looking for with meditation, it's basically a voluntary controlled sleep of the physical body while the mind retains focus and concentration. Okay, so that's the key and literally when you let your physical body fall asleep. And that's why the relaxation becomes so important because we want to let the physical body get to that state. We do the complete breath, that proper breathing technique to slow the rate of respiration and to slow the heart rate as well. That's why we want to make sure we take the time to properly prepare the physical body because this is what we're trying to do. Ironically, uh, not a lot of people really know how to relax and relaxation is a skill. With time, you get better and better at it as in you can put yourself in a deeper state much quicker. In the beginning, everything in your house bothers you. The traffic outside bothers you. The neighbor's stereo bothers you. The heat, everything seems to bother you and prevent you from relaxing. But over time, you can quickly get yourself into a really deep state of relaxation, which is what you need for meditation. If we fall asleep with no thoughts, because remember thoughts are just the manifestation of the ego in the intellectual center, right? The ego is responsible for that endless chain of thoughts streaming through our head. Remember we have about 30 to 40,000 thoughts a day. What we're doing with meditation is there was something happened to prevent all those random thoughts. What was that really important thing that we were going to try to do? Concentration. Yeah, concentration. Remember that? The idea with concentration is we shut down that thought process. Concentration was holding a single thought with a purpose, whether it was on a visualization, whether it's on our heart, or our breathing, or on a mantra, or a chant, or whatever. What we're trying to do is stop that thought process and take control of the intellectual center. If you're concentrating successfully, basically you've wrestled control of the intellectual center away from the ego. Okay? Now, if we fall asleep at that point, if the physical body drifts off to sleep while we retain control of the intellectual center, then there's no thoughts there. Therefore, we have no dreams. Okay, so meditation is like going into a dream but staying conscious. Because the ego is not there, we don't have any dreams because there's no thoughts to trigger them. There's no egos to project, which allows us to go beyond the world of dreams to perceive the reality of the higher dimensions. Okay, they didn't see meditation and going to sleep every night is when you go to sleep, the ego is there. That random non-stop chain of thoughts projecting memories and worries and future planning that's constantly going through your mind, that's there. So that's what you see in the astral. Remember the higher dimensions, the astral conforms to thought. We perceive the reality of the ego there. All the wants, desires, manifestations of the ego become the reality that we perceive. With meditation, what we're trying to do is shut down that whole process, giving us control of our thoughts, giving us control of our mind. So when we 
unfold into the astral because our body's fallen asleep, then that allows us to project ourselves consciously into a dimension that's outside of the three physical dimensions that we see before us. That's what we're trying to do with meditation. That's why the sleep aspect is so important. We have to combine meditation with sleep, a controlled sleep of the physical body. And that's why, as I mentioned earlier, when they do clinical studies, somebody who's in a deep state of meditation and somebody who's sleeping, there's not a lot of differences in the way that their body's behaving and their brain waves are acting. Okay, there's a certain set of brain waves called the theta waves, which occur in the early stages of sleep, what's known as the hypnagogic state, and also become really active in a deep state of meditation. Interestingly enough, small children regularly have a lot of active theta waves during the day. Okay, but as we go older and older, we get less and less of them. So finally, they only occur for a short period before going into and leaving REM sleep. Okay, so children already have a whole lot of stuff active that we've lost the use of. Okay, which is why there's a lot we can learn from children as well. Um, children are able to see things, experience things, and hear more reality than we're actually able of doing. Okay, and with meditation, we're going to try to wrestle some of that back. So that's the key, keeping that thought process controlled so when the physical body actually falls asleep, we enter the higher dimensions in control with our consciousness active. Meditation then does more than simply quiet the mind, it opens up a door for us to penetrate into the heavens, the higher dimensions and the heavens, it's basically the same thing. We'll talk about meditation being you know, something that we use to quiet, quiet the mind. Concentration is really what we use to quiet the mind. Meditation is that spontaneous thing that happens once the physical body falls asleep and we've gained control of the intellectual process. Okay, remember when the thought process comes under control, when the thought process comes under control, illumination comes spontaneously. We looked at that quote last week and that's what we're talking about here. <clears throat> now let's look at lots of different ways of concentration. Any meditation technique that you come across, that you read in a book, that you've experienced for yourself, that you've practiced or whatever, they're all really the same thing. It's all about this, the word that you're so sick of hearing me saying all the time. Concentration is key. Every meditation technique is just something for you to concentrate on. Okay, It's just something for you to focus your mind on in an attempt to wrestle control of the thought process away from the ego. Consequently, there's a whole lot of different techniques that we'll be looking at. We're going to go through some of the more popular ones today, and we've already, over the course of the classes we've been doing here, looked at a bunch of different techniques already for different states of meditation. Uh, there's various techniques and focal points for concentration. It, that's all you have to remember is it doesn't matter what you're doing with the meditation, everything just becomes a focal point. It just becomes a technique for you to learn to concentrate. Okay? The first ones, and these are the ones that we've been experimenting with for the past few weeks, are mantras. This is the one that we did last week, right? The one that was actually playing on the, the music earlier. Gate, gate, paragate, parasangate, bodhi, swaha. We looked at that one. And that one was the one that was used to reach the illuminated void, right? The illuminated void was the experience of the truth. And that was basically really submerging our consciousness deep into the higher dimensions, basically merging back with the source of all things. Okay, temporarily. Uh, here's another one that's useful for meditation, the mantra Wu, W-U. And it's used to clear the mind of all thoughts. You can think of it like the sound of the wind blowing through the trees or ocean waves crashing against the ocean, whatever you like. I like to think of it as the sound of wind blowing because I like to imagine it's literally blowing all the thoughts out of my mind. This is an ancient oriental one and it comes back to a story of a Chinese master. So there's a Chinese master and a student, and this student has been learning meditation. And he comes to the Chinese master and he says, Master, I finally mastered meditating. And the master says, Oh, have you? He said, Yes. The master says, Well, go outside and meditate. And he says, But it's raining outside and it's night and there's tons of mosquitoes. How am I possibly going to meditate under those circumstances? And the master says, You haven't learned concentration. Ideally, you could be anywhere, anytime, and if you have that much concentration, you could be out in the middle of a rainstorm with mosquitoes biting you and you know, wind and rain everywhere, and you'd still be able to keep yourself calm and controlled and in a relaxed state. Okay? And then the rest of the story is he gives him this mantra to work on. He says, you're still not ready. Go practice this for another however long until you can get to that point where you can be outside in the rain and still maintain a deep state of meditation. Okay, I'm going to play with that one later today, the mantra woo. And I'm going to give you one a week for, for as long as you want to listen to me, really. 
Um, we're basically going to look at a different mantra a week for the next, I don't know, probably 20 weeks or something like that. Mantras never really go away. They're always there. Um, there's tons and tons of different mantras. In the end, they all do the same thing. Okay? You don't have to learn them all. At some point, some point it becomes overwhelming because I'm giving you a different practice every week. And you're like, what am I supposed to do? i got like 30 practices and you want me to practice like twice a day? Like, I need to live and eat and stuff. How am I supposed to do all this practicing? Remember, you only need one. Any one mantra is more than enough. Okay? There's so many different mantras because there's so many different types of people. The idea being I'm going to give out all these different mantras till eventually you find one that works for you, till you find one that you like. As I mentioned, I don't know why, this is my favorite one. Don't ask me why, it's just I've done a ton of mantras, and one day I did that one, and I was like, whoa, I really like this one. No idea why. So that was the one that I stuck with. You might have done that one last week and thought, I don't really like that singing kind of chanting thing. I'd rather just do like O for the heart or something like that. It doesn't matter. Yeah? What does it mean again? Like, what is the translation? Uh, gone, gone. Gone to the other shore, completely gone to the other shore. Enlightenment and swaha is like a, like a hail, hallelujah kind of thing. Yeah, and gone to the other shore, you, could, you can also um, translate that as other side, like the other dimension, the other world, the other shore of the ocean, the other side of life kind of thing. You can look at it that way. Um, so in the end, it, what I would recommend is every week when we do a different mantra, go home and try it. Try it a couple times and go, I don't really like that, or hey, this is kind of neat, and stick with it. It's better that you pick one and stick with it than you try a different one all the time because you're not really developing any um, abilities with it. Don't forget, too, some of the mantras work specific chakras. Remember the energy centers of our body? And in order for the chakra to develop, you've got to keep feeding them energy for a sustained period of time. So if you're trying to develop a particular chakra, changing them up every week isn't really going to be a benefit either. So what I would say is pick the one that you want to work with, and then every week just you know, try putting the new one into your routine and see whether or not you like it. If you don't like it, then don't do it again. Okay, I have mantras that I've been taught that I tried once or twice, and I'm like, yeah, I don't like it. And I have to teach them at one point in the class, but secretly I won't tell you which ones. I'm like, I just don't like this. I never do this one. It doesn't do anything for me for whatever reason. Everybody's different. If you find one you like, you stick with it. Give them all a, a, a chance to see if they work, and if not, just pick one and work with it for an extended duration. Uh, definitely don't be meditating and try like a different mantra every five minutes or something. Like stick with it for an extended duration and keep mixing it up all the time, especially not during the practice itself. So mantras will never go away. We've looked at probably five or six already. We're going to keep looking at more mantras, but um, I don't want to focus the entire time on mantras because let's look at some of the other different things you can do. Uh, another technique for meditation are koans, Zen koans. Uh, they're basically little tricks to occupy and silence the mind. Because your mind's kind of a, a, a pest that way, and that it's a really a difficult thing to control. Uh, Zen koans are little tricks that we can use to occupy and silence the mind. It's a way that we can exhaust our mental process by giving it a little trick, a little riddle to try to solve. A Zen koan is meant to be inaccessible to rational understanding. It's a riddle that your mind cannot solve because it has no rational answer, okay? It's like a question that can only be answered by the consciousness, okay? It's a question that the intellectual process, the ego, can't answer, because the intellectual process relies quite heavily on reason and logic. Things are supposed to happen very reasonable and very logical, okay? And that reason and logic is based on things we've been taught, our life experience, things that we've seen, things that other people have done. That's how we assemble the process of reason and logic that we have. Memories and experiences come uh, into, into play big time with that. But a Zen koan is a trick. It's something that doesn't speak directly to the rational mind. It speaks directly to the consciousness. And remember we talked last week, that's the way a lot of the world's great books are written. Books like the Bible, the Quran, the Bhagavad Gita, they weren't meant to be taken literally. And many times there's passages that people still fight and argue over the interpretation of. The idea being it wasn't supposed to be interpreted like that. It was supposed to be meditated upon to reach the point where the information reaches the consciousness where the meaning is fully grasped. That was a way to ensure that the books couldn't be misunderstood and mistranslated and misused. It was meant to speak directly to the consciousness.
But long ago, we've forgotten what it means to meditate and really contemplate on those writings. We just want to read everything quickly at face value and read the stuff like a novel. We don't have the attention span or the consciousness anymore to approach the great books like that. So consequently, we've got people, you know, fighting and thousands of people dying every year over whose interpretation is right or wrong and who's got the right God and who's got the wrong God, unfortunately. Koans are kind of like that. Uh, what happens when we're working with a Zen koan is the mind fails to grasp the meaning and find the answer, and in the end, the intellectual process is defeated. Okay, it's like literally uh, having a dog, you know, like a crazy dog, like a Jack Russell Terrier. The dog like runs around forever. It would be like giving him a toy that completely wore him out. So he ran around circles forever, 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 until he just fell down dead. That's what you're trying to do with the mind. Think of your mind being like a Jack Russell Terrier. It won't sit still. It always has to think of something, think of something, think of something. What we're trying to do with the Zen Koan, it's like the ultimate dog toy. Okay? All it does is it keeps the mind so busy and forces the mind into overdrive until eventually the intellectual process just stops, until the mind exhausts itself. Remembering that koans can't be grasped with the intellect. When you first look at them, and I'll show you some, it does, doesn't make sense. That's crazy, that's silly, it doesn't mean anything. Okay, that's the point. The point is it's going to speak directly to the intuition. It speaks directly to the consciousness. You have to force the mind to crack the riddle. Okay, knowing that at some point your uh, conscious, sorry, at some point the, the intellectual center, the rationalization and, and, and logic process ends and the consciousness bursts forth. And it's the consciousness that's able to grasp the meaning of the koan. Examples of koans, some of these are, are pretty famous. You've probably heard of some of these before. What came first, the chicken or the egg? It's funny, that's a Zen koan that goes back a few thousand years. Okay, they originated in, in, in Zen Buddhism uh, thousands of years ago. What came first, the chicken or the egg? So the way you process that is, you, okay, your intellectual mind says, well, obviously chickens lay eggs, so the chicken had to come first. Ah, you see, but don't eggs come from chickens? Well, yeah, eggs come from chickens, but so if the chicken laid the egg, where'd the chicken come from? Well, chickens come from eggs. You get with them, how did the egg get there? Because it was laid by the chicken, but there was no chicken, it was only an egg. Okay, then the egg was first, but then where the egg come from? Was, you just run around with, over and over and over again with your mind, okay? Because that doesn't make sense, right? It seems silly to, you know, to, to even debate that, but is there an answer? To the consciousness, there is an answer, okay? But to the intellectual process, the, I don't know, chicken, egg, chicken, egg, chicken, egg, it's, what's going on there? Okay, so what the idea is, we'll talk a little bit more about this, is to enter into a meditation and solve that. And as silly as that was sounding as I was going back and forth, that's what your mind does. You let your mind go with that, over and over and over and over again. Imagining there's the first chicken laying the first egg. Okay, but if there's no egg, then how could that chicken be there? Okay, there's the egg, and now there's the chicken. Ah, but if the egg was there, where was the chicken? Okay, we'll put the chicken in there, and you just keep going over and over and over on that. Okay, forcing your mind to keep on the problem. Here's another famous one. What is the sound of one hand clapping? <laughs> this one's actually been ruined for me. I can't do this one anymore. Uh, I teach an acoustics class at the college I work at, and a student came in one day, and I gave them this kind of a, a you know, Zen koan sort of a thing to talk about acoustics and sound. And he had this weird double-jointed wrist thing, and he goes easy like this. And he made this clapping sound. And forever, now I know what one hand clapping sounds like, so I can't do that one anymore. Okay, that's a famous one. Um, here is a really famous one. If a tree falls in the woods and there's no one around to hear it, does it make a sound? Okay, so you have to start contemplating more what is sound, because sound is just moving air, right? But if it's just moving air and there's no ear drum to perceive it, then is it actually sound or is it just air moving? Okay, there's another famous one. If a tree falls in the woods and no one is around to hear it, does it actually make a sound? This is a really famous one, and I really like this one. It is not the mind, it is not the Buddha, it is nothing. So what is it then? And these Zen koans, they were not only given uh, to students by the masters as a way to meditate, there was also an answer. And when the student had reached the right level of preparation, he would be able to come to the master and say, this is the answer. And the master would know, yes, you're ready. You're, you're successful. You've been able to do it. Okay, so these actually, <laughs> as crazy as they are, they have an answer. It's not an answer that would be grasped by reason and logic in the intellectual center. It is an answer that would be grasped by the consciousness. Okay, so if you really wanted to, you could practice on this one for weeks and weeks and weeks, and you'd actually get an answer to that question. And in the ancient times, that's, what the, that's how the masters, the Zen Buddhist masters, would know their students were ready. Because they'd be given a question like this, 
and the student would have to wait until they found the answer, come back to the master and say, this is the answer to the riddle. The master would say, yes, you're ready. You've reached the right state of development. Okay, and there's literally tons of these. This is a different, there's another koan. It's a different kind of exercise. Uh, this is a visualization one. If you have a really active mind, sometimes it helps when you're meditating to work with visualization. Okay? So the way this one works, you could take an object, I don't know, let's take this remote thing, and you could break it down into its components. So it's probably made out of two halves of plastic and some batteries and a little electrical circuit board and some buttons. Okay, what are they made out of? They're probably made of plastic and metal and some paint and that kind of stuff. Okay, what are they made out of? They'll be made out of, you know, like, um, you know, molecules and that kind of thing. Okay, what are they made out of? You know, little atoms and electrons and neutrons. Okay, what are they made out of? Like neutrinos and then what are they made out of? You just keep going down and down and down and down until you get to what? What's the source of all things? Okay, what you'd have to do is arrive at that point with your mind. Okay, not merely an intellectual exercise, but actually arriving down to the point of all creation of everything is what you're trying to do by delving into this one. Okay, so it could be anything. It could be whatever you have in front of you. Just sit down and stare at it and start breaking it apart in your mind into smaller and smaller particles. Okay, pushing your limits of rational understanding. Because we can all visualize what a, an atom looks like, right? Kind of given the image of the little electrons and neutrons and all that kind of stuff. Well, what are they made out of? they got to be made out of stuff. Okay, then you start using the imagination process. What is that made out of? Just delving deeper and deeper and deeper until eventually your consciousness takes over and it'll actually show you what's behind all things. So that's another one. It's not so much a koan, it's the same kind of approach as a koan. Uh, if you're into Zen koans, you can just type them into Google. There's literally hundreds of them. You can just find one you like and go, yeah, I want to give that one a go. Okay, because I just really like that one, don't know why I just do. Okay, this one uh, I don't like too much. This one's been ruined for me. I like this one as well. Uh, here's another type of a Zen koan, a visualization exercise. Imagine you're, hang you're hanging in the middle of a forest by a rope 20 feet off the ground. You've got no clothes on, your hands are tied, your feet are tied, you've got no tools. How are you going to escape? Try to run through all these little scenarios, how you can get yourself down, get that rope untied with everything that you've got tied. You can't bite the rope, you can't cut the rope, you can't do anything. You've got no tools, you've got nothing around you. There's no one to help you. There's nothing in reach. You can't swing yourself anything. How are you going to get down? It's the middle of nowhere, stranded from this rope. Just same thing as all of these. You attempt to figure it out. You just make your mind, just keep thinking and thinking and thinking about the koan and how to solve it. You have to concentrate on the koan and attempt to solve the riddle. The way this works is you let your mind explore every possibility, no matter how silly. Your mind's going to suggest, oh, this is, a, this is a, a way we can go with this. Then you want to run that logic down until it encounters a brick wall. Okay, turn around and do it again on something else. Well, what about this? And then go that way. No, that didn't work. Okay, just like the logic of the chicken and the egg. What comes first, the chicken or the egg? Okay, well, chickens lay eggs. Chickens have to come first. Let's go explore that route. Okay, the chicken was first. But chickens come from eggs. So we need an egg before we get a chicken. Okay, that didn't work. Okay, the egg was first and the egg hatched into a chicken. But then who laid the first egg? Okay, let's go back to the chicken again. You're just exploring the different options, letting your mind run with them until you hit an obstacle. Okay, once you hit the obstacle, you retreat and then try something else. No matter what, how silly it comes into your mind, no matter how goofy it is, you want to explore the possibility. You want to take that particular nugget of reason or logic and basically exploit it until there's nothing left. That's what you're trying to do with the koan, okay? You have to be determined. Gradually, your mind will tire out, okay? You can literally force the mind to do the chicken egg thing using each reason. Chicken first, no, this is why. Egg first, no, this is why. Chicken first, no. Egg first, just back and forth like that. Eventually, your mind tires out, but you have to be determined. Because you know what your mind does when it gets bored? I want to think about something else now. I want to think about summer vacation. I want to think about the barbecue. I want it, your mind just attempts to abandon the koan and run away before it's exhausted. You have to bring it right back and say, nope, we're doing this. Okay, think of a stubborn child that doesn't want to wash the dishes and you got to grab them, put them in front of the sink, and you can't move until they're done. Okay, that's what you're doing with your mind. You can't go until this is solved. Forcing them to attack the koan. It's persistence that's the key. Your mind will attempt to distract you with regular mundane thoughts. Don't identify with them and lose the cone. If you're trying to solve the chicken or egg, that's all you should be thinking about. Concentration is key and persistence is really important. Okay, you want to tire out the mind. If you keep giving the mind a break, 
by letting it think about the barbecue or think about summer vacation, then you're letting the mind recharge itself before it comes back to it. You want to tire it out. Think of that crazy Jack Russell Terry. You don't let it stop and rest. You want to keep it running until it falls over. Okay, that's what you're doing with your mind with the Zen Koan. Keeping it on the Koan and making it solve the riddle, making it find the answer. No matter how bored or how distracted you become, you got to force it to solve the riddle because eventually your mind stops. The intellectual process ceases and the Koan starts bringing you answers. You start to see different courses that you didn't see available and you start to arrive at a different point. Okay, don't give up. It's persistence which tires out the mind. Okay, that's the key to using a Zen Koan. There's another technique we can look at. Uh, this one we'll do at the end as well. This one is a really interesting one. There's something called the duality technique. And this one is actually quite revealing uh, on a lot of different levels. So we've looked at the ideas of mantras. We've been using mantras for a few weeks now. We used a good mantra last week. We're going to work with the mantra Wu this week. Uh, we looked at Zen Koans, which were just riddles. There's a lot more of them you can find on the internet if you didn't like any of the ones that are listed. But the duality technique is different. The duality technique is the continuous process of placing opposites against every thought that we have. The duality technique is simply whatever enters in your mind, you think the exact opposite. That's what the duality technique is all about. Okay, Intentionally thinking the opposite of whatever thought enters your mind. Okay, And this is really interesting because this teaches us a lot about the way our thought process works. And it teaches us a lot about the duality of the mind. Our brain literally has two hemispheres. And for us, everything is opposite. Okay, And we can arrive at some really interesting conclusions about the intellectual process by doing this exercise, in addition to actually reaching a deep state of meditation. Remember, every thought that you have, everything that enters your mind, is one of two polarities, a positive and a negative. And I don't mean like good and bad, I mean thesis and antithesis. Okay? Um, Hot, cold, in, out, left, right, up, down, forwards, backwards, pleasure, pain, happiness, sadness, whatever it is, there's an opposite to it. That's how we're hardwired to think. Every single thought that up enters our mind, we see as a duality to something else. Okay? The key to the duality technique is working with this concept, the idea that there's a thesis and the antithesis. When the thesis and the antithesis come together, they're reconciled in the synthesis. Okay? You take one step forward, but then you take one step backwards, have you gone anywhere? No. No. Okay? You've got the positive, you've got the negative, and that's reconciled and balanced in the neutral, which is the concept of the Trinity, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, right? Isis, Osiris, and Horus. You've got two polarities that are reconciled with the third. You've got the father, the mother, reconciled in the child, the son or the daughter, it doesn't really matter. Okay? So we've got the thesis and the antithesis, the two poles. And through the two poles, we can arrive at a synthesis, the reconciliation of those two opposites. And that's what we're trying to do with the duality technique. Everything that you can think of, even just running that through your mind right now, you're going to find an opposite for. Okay, That's exactly the way the mind works. And it's that technique that we're going to use to exploit that little shortcoming of our mind in the way that it looks at things. Through the study of opposites, we arrive at the synthesis, and that's what I was just talking about. Every mental form can be eliminated through its synthesis. The ego introduces an idea into the mind, or introduces a memory or an image into the mind in an attempt to get us to identify with it, right? So the ego says, ah, oh, barbecue, summer. And now we identify with that image of the barbecue in the summer, and we start thinking about it. This is the food I'm going to get. This is who I'm going to invite. This is what I'm going to do. And you start basically daydreaming or fantasizing about that barbecue, which we know pulls you out of the present moment, right? Remember, that's one of the challenges of being human. You're never in the present moment. Ironically, you miss your entire life. You're sitting in that chair right now, but you're not really here. What well, you're here now because I said that, but you'll be gone in a few seconds. Okay, you'll be drifting off into the past or you know, dragged ahead into the future. Either way, you're never conscious. Okay? And this is what we're trying to do with the duality technique. We're going to try to eliminate those mental forms. And this is interesting because um, one of the classes that I teach, I teach an acoustic class, which is why I occasionally give you all this you know, physics type stuff. And there's this interesting experiment that you can do in acoustics that I like to show with my students. You can make a speaker make sound into a room and then you can make another speaker make the sound in the opposite polarity, 
And those two really loud speakers actually cancel each other out, and there's a point in the room where there is no sound whatsoever. Okay? This is exactly what you're trying to do in your mind. Okay, so this is something that you can demonstrate physically. You can do it with light, you can do it with sound, you can do it with radiation, just by inverting polarities. Okay, so you can have a point in a room where there is no sound by messing with the, dual, the polarization of the speakers. Okay, you can do the same thing with light and other stuff as well. That's what we're trying to do in our mind. The thought that comes into our mind is like one polarity. We're going to instead generate the opposite polarity to cancel the thought out. It's like our mind wants to push us in a direction that makes us take one step forward, but we immediately take a step backwards so we haven't gone anywhere. So we haven't gone into the past or gone into the future, but we remain in the present moment with our consciousness and our awareness active. Okay, that's what we're trying to do with the duality technique. Remembering that the thoughts we have, they should pass through the mind without leaving a trace. Remember I said before, the thoughts in our mind should be like cars on the street. They just simply drive by. Okay? We don't acknowledge it. We don't get in the car and let it take us for a ride. We just happen to let it drive by. Or you can sometimes say the our thoughts in our mind should be like clouds in the sky. They just drift by. They're inconsequential. They're there, but they're not a part of us. And they just simply pass us by without interacting with us whatsoever. That's what we're trying to do here. When we reach that state where the thoughts just simply pass us by, then we can say that we're not identifying with them. So the ego is generating the thoughts in an attempt to get our attention. But if we simply let the thought go, then we can stay in the present moment. We can keep our consciousness active without falling back into the daydream, without falling back into the want and the fantasy, the desire, and the illusion that we see before us. Okay, so thoughts should pass through our mind without moving us without pushing us in a particular direction, without us identifying with that particular thought. We eliminate the effects of the thought by arriving at the synthesis. Okay? Imagine your mind like a clear lake. That's what it should be. But every time a thought enters your mind, be it a memory or an image or something like that, that suddenly creates all these ripples that travel out on the lake. Those ripples are like you traveling along with the thought to see you know, where it goes, what are we going to, if it's a, a thought about summer vacation, what are we going to do, where are we going to go, who are we going to invite, what's going to happen, how much money is it going to cost, those are like the ripples that are created by that initial thought. So the thought is like the stone dropped in the pond, but then all the ripples that are created are like you identifying with the thought, letting it go in all those different directions. What we want to create is a situation where the, imagine a calm blue lake and a stone drops into it and then nothing. There's no ripples. That's what we're trying to do with the duality technique. We eliminate the traces by arriving at the synthesis. The thought is a push or an energy in one direction, and we're going to push back with an equal amount of energy or force in another direction. The net result being no movement. There's no consciousness shift. You simply stay in the present moment with the awareness active. So you don't identify with the thought or the image. The one aspect, the one polarity, be it, say, negative or positive, cancels the other one and negates the effect of the thought. It's the whole one step forward, one step backwards, I haven't moved anywhere. Okay? Every thought is the ego pushing us in a direction. Okay? Normally we let it push us and then we let it take us around and then come back again. Okay? What we're going to do with the duality technique is the ego is going to generate a push which you immediately encounter with a push back. Okay? So right now if you're thinking it's hot in here, no, it's not, it's cold. <laughs> Okay? If you're thinking about, oh, this, I'm going to have such a good party this weekend with my friends over for the barbecue, no, you're not. It's going to be boring. Same old people talking about the same monotonous stuff. You're probably going to eat too much. You're going to probably drink too much and feel sick the next day. Okay? That's exactly how that process works. For every thought that comes in our mind, it's always one polarity. We always associate it with one aspect, and after that, we're able to immediately generate the opposite aspect. Look at some examples. Uh, let's say, this is a, a difficult one, but let's say we're faced with a memory or image of our significant other. So let's say that, because that's usually a strong image for some people. It's not as simple as, well, it's hot in here, and also not as cold. It's a fairly simple one, right? But let's look at a complicated one. So the image comes to our mind of a significant other. We have one association with that, okay? And that association is one polarity. Beauty, attraction, desire, whatever we want. Okay, that's just one polarity, whatever that means to us. 
if it's maybe if it's not a recent significant other, maybe it might not be those. Maybe it might be a bit more negative. Okay, <laughs> but no matter what comes up, there's an association that means something to us, and we've attached various adjectives or whatever with that aspect. But we can look at it a different way. We can say that's just one side of the coin. We also have to acknowledge the other side. Okay, because all beauty is, you know, fleeting. It's going to fade. Eventually, all physical bodies die and return to the dust. Okay? By really understanding this, and by really understanding this, we arrive at the synthesis. Beauty and attraction fade, they're just an illusion. Okay? In the end, there's much more to existence than something as simple as an attraction that we have to somebody. Okay? So these are things we have to, you know, experiment for ourselves with our own mind, but this is the way this works. We have one polarity, we then have to study and acknowledge the other polarity, which allows us to arrive at the synthesis, the blending of the two. Okay, it's, another way of looking at it is, you know, a coin, heads or tails, what's your favorite? You know, I have heads, I want to call tails, whatever. It's the same coin, it doesn't matter. You're talking about two sides of the same thing, in the end it's just a coin. It just happens to have two sides. Being human, we don't want to acknowledge that. We only want to acknowledge one polarity of everything. We draw this line in the sand and we say, I like this, I don't like that, on the other side. I only want to be over here, I never want to be over there. And this leads to a really important law we're going to study much later on called Law of the Pendulum. By defining our own happiness in life, we automatically create our own sadness. By defining our own pleasure, we also immediately define our own pain as well. If I say, these are the conditions when I'm happy when I'm with friends, and I'm happy at parties, and I'm happy when I have lots of money, and I'm happy when I have nice clothes, and I'm happy when I have a house, well, I've just defined everything that makes me unhappy. And that's a hell of a lot bigger list than the five things that I just listed on this hand. And we do that as humans all the time. And that's something that we can uncover by using the duality technique. We can discover the way our mind works and creates these little polarities. How we draw this line on the sand and say, these things are good, these things are bad. I only want these, I never want those. And by reaching further and further and further to the one side, we're also drawing ourselves further to the other side. Think of a pendulum that swings, right? The further you push the pendulum to the left, what's going to happen? the further it pushes to the right. So by us constantly reaching for pleasure and pain through artificial means, through movies and television and possessions and that kind of stuff, we're pushing the pendulum further and further, which when it swings the other way, takes us further and further into the other side. By defining and craving and desiring and fantasizing about our own happiness and pleasures, we've also defined our own pain and unhappiness as well. And a state, the universe always strives in a state of balance. You can't have pleasure without the pain. The more time you spend over there, the more time you're going to have to spend over here. And that's what they talk about with uh, the concept in the Orient of the Tao, the point of balance. Okay? And that's what we're trying to have with the duality technique. Even the Tree of Life illustrates that with the pillar of severity and the pillar of mercy, and the one that sits in the middle is the pillar of balance, the middle pillar. And that's what we're trying to reach for in life. Okay, that's why in esoteric studies, they talk, or sometimes they'll call it uh, walking the path of the razor's edge. Imagine trying to walk on a razor blade. It's so narrow and it's right down the middle. It's so easy to fall left or so easy to fall right. That's what we're trying to do. Find the path of balance in life. Not only balance in you know, pleasure and money and that kind of stuff, but also a balance in our emotions, balance in our intellect, all that stuff. Okay? And really understanding the duality technique allows us to experience that state of balance, what that's like, that Zen or that Tao, okay? being in the present moment. Okay? Because our whole life, it's like one half of the pendulum is the past, one half of the pendulum is the future, but there's a very precise point in time when the pendulum is neither left nor right, it's the exact dead center, that's the present moment. That's where we're on. But we don't, rather than jump off the pendulum and simply watch it, we ride the pendulum as it swings from one side to the other, pulling us into the pleasure and pulling us into the pain. What we want to do is jump off and have a different perspective right in the middle. That's what we're trying to do with the duality technique. Okay? That synthesis is that point of balance. It's neither one extreme or the other, it's the exact correlation of the two. Okay? And that's the state which the consciousness works at. It's the ego that's driving the push to the one side or the other. It's the consciousness that's able to grasp that synthesis, that balance. Okay? And we're going to work with this technique today because this is actually quite interesting because it really teaches you a lot about your mind. Um, and it's different in that other techniques you're trying to you know, stop your thoughts. 
With the duality technique, you're like, bring them on. Let's go. Think of stuff. Come on. Which the weird thing is, you usually immediately stop thinking about stuff when that happens because it's almost a form of self observation, too. Suddenly, let's be conscious of my thoughts. I'm thinking this. Okay, what about that? What about this? And how about this? And you have a little tug of war with yourself, right? You're having a tug of war with your mind until eventually your mind says, ah, screw it, I'm done. And you're left in control. Okay? That's actually what's happening with the duality technique. So some examples. If we imagine, the, think of the room as warm, imagine it being cold. If we're thinking about the good time we had with friends last night, think of how boring and monotonous they were. <laughs> the result is to make every arising thought ineffective. No ripples on the pond. Okay? Every arising thought becomes ineffective. For every step forward the mind attempts to take, we make it take a step backwards. Okay? Breaking that thought process. Because it's the flow of energy from positive and negative that the ego uses to sustain itself. It's the flow of energy from positive to negative which actually sustains all of creation. Okay? Think of the light, the battle between the light and the darkness. They're just two polarities of energy. And it's the constant shift and balance of energy between those two points that basically fuel all of creation. Okay? The ego uses that to sustain itself because it knows it can push us one side or the other and we're going to, just like a teeter-totter, one person pushes up, the other person pushes down. So they're swinging back and forth. The ego uses that to fuel and sustain itself. What we're trying to do with this process is interrupt it, to bring the mind to a halt. Okay, by every little step forward, we push it backwards until eventually the ego and the mind just gives up and says, ah, forget it. And then we have arrived at a different state of consciousness. Okay, we've arrived at that synthesis, that state of Tao, that state of Zen. The infinite procession of thoughts are exhausted and the mind remains still. And we know that at that point, it's not, it's not that you're thinking about nothing, it's a whole different concept, right? It's that state of non-thought, that state of elevated thought. It's a, an emptiness that's full of everything, <laughs> for lack of a better term. And we can use the Rally technique to reach that place. It's the same thing, it's another concentration exercise, but this one's a twist because we're kind of bringing our thoughts on, we're letting them happen, and then hitting them each time a thought hits us, we hit back. The next thought that comes, we hit back. And you stick with it for a while, and eventually what happens is the thoughts cease entirely, and you've reached a different state of consciousness. Uh, let's look at some of the different opticals of meditation. If you looked at mantras, you've got a ton of those already. Um, we looked at the Zen koans, we looked at the duality technique, and now let's look at some of the ways that, um, that, that people go wrong. There are little challenges, little things that are kind of uh, bumps in the road that sometimes can, can give us a hard time. During meditation, our mind is, and I'm using the term assaulted here, because that's what it feels like. The harder you fight the mind, the harder it starts to fight back. Okay, you can be assaulted by all kinds of different memories, preoccupations, desires, and it's really interesting because the more you meditate, the more you start to control the regular mundane thoughts, the ego gets tricky and it'll throw like a wild card at you. So next thing you know, you're entering a meditation and you just, you know, things are going on, then suddenly a memory comes up that you haven't thought about in 20, 30 years maybe. You're like, where the hell did that come from? And it's got your attention that you just riveted and stuck with it. That's, that's the ego getting tricky. It's saying, okay, you don't want to think about work, you don't want to think about home, you don't want to think about the summer, you haven't thought about this in a while, <laughs> and it kind of throws something at you that really gets your attention, okay? And it's weird, but you have to remember that the ego is, is its own consciousness, it's its own intelligence, it knows exactly what it's doing, and it's wrestling for control of your mind, okay? And the more you practice with meditation, the more you really get a sense of that, where you're just going into a meditation and just when you're right at that point where you're probably going to win, suddenly there's this thought that comes out of nowhere. Sometimes it's a pleasant, really pleasant thought, you know, your first kiss or something like that. Or sometimes it's like a weird fear or something that comes out of nowhere. You're like, whoa, I haven't thought about that for a while. That really freaked me out. That was weird. Okay, all these things seem to come out of nowhere. Is it like a, a song that you can't get rid of in your head and just keeps on playing in your head? Do you ever have yeah, that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You hear a song and, it just, and you don't even like it. Yeah, yeah. No, same thing, same thing just can happen with thoughts. Yeah. Oh. Same thing can happen with the thought. Yeah. And in some cases, um, really negative states like depression and stuff are a result of that. You get stuck with a negative thought and you just can't get it out, and that brings on depression and anxiety and 
all the associated effects. And um, yeah, okay. they call it ruminating in psychiatry. Yeah, like a cow. <laughs> yeah you just can't stop. You just keep going over and over and over yeah. and over again. The same thing. Uh, and, but that can happen during meditation. You just get stuck with something, and it's a really strong thought that you can't, uh, you can't get away from. Um, the good news is if you've got to that point, you're obviously doing something very right. <laughs> Because you were actually, you know, fighting all the regular mundane thoughts until something stronger came through. The egos are simply creating conflicts to our attention and concentration in an attempt to distract us. Okay, because it wants us to identify with thoughts. Because when we identify with thoughts, then we feed and sustain the ego at the expense of the consciousness. Okay, we need to, to break that. To establish a correct basis of meditation, when you go into a meditation, you got to be free of ambition, fear, egotism, greed for powers, and yearning for results. If you're like an instant gratification person, then you're not going to have a very pleasant time in meditation. If you're kind of like, I want everything, and I want it now, and I don't have to work for it. I'm going to go home tonight, and I want to meditate for 20 minutes, and I want to experience the illuminated void, and I want to stare directly at the face of God before my TV show starts at 8.30. Is that going to happen? Yeah, no. Okay? Uh, what I mean... Uh, Yearning, greed for powers is a lot of people get interested in things like astral, astral projection, intuition, clairvoyance, and all yeah. that kind of stuff. Yeah. Those things, I like to think of them more as um, side effects of meditation. They shouldn't be what you're seeking, but it might happen along the way. Okay, people that really want to get into things like uh, you know fortune telling and clairvoyance, and sometimes they get too caught up in those, and they never actually learn to meditate properly which is what you need to activate some of those higher powers that we have. Uh, fear is a funny one. We'll talk about fear because there's a can be a large element of fear in meditation. As same thing with astral projection and some of the other things that can happen to us. We'll talk about that. Um, yearning for results, free of ambition, that's the same thing. You should meditate for the sake of meditating. Because okay? it's great for the physical body. So it does wonders for your heart rate and your blood pressure and your stress levels. That's what you should do it for. So I'm going to sit down for half an hour just to, just to be by myself for half an hour. Not because I want to see the face of God, because I want to ask to project, because I want to remember every single past I've ever had. Because that's not the right basis. You're going to come out disappointed. And what happens is if you set the ladder too high too quick, um, you get discouraged. Okay? Just like people that uh, I, I'm all around music a lot and uh, musicians. And it's the same thing. If you've had a, a child, you've probably experienced this. Children that want to take up a sport or take up music, and they want to be able to do something amazing within the first few days, and they can't, so they give it up. So that guitar they got for Christmas, come February, sitting in a closet somewhere, never to be touched again. It's the same thing, and we're just as bad as adults. Okay? Have, if you started piano lessons, you know that you wouldn't be able to play uh, box works within the first few months. Try a few years if you were lucky. Meditation's the same way. It's a goal that you want to get to, but it's not an instant goal. It's a goal you have to work towards. Okay, which is why I always say treat the classes here like learning to play an instrument. You get a little bit of homework. The idea being you try your homework during the week. Okay, no one's ever going to ask you that. You'd be your own judge. But if you don't practice the stuff, eventually when we get into more advanced things, you're not going to have the foundation, the basis in place to do some of the more complicated stuff. It's the same thing. The largest obstacle, you knew it was coming, didn't you? Oh, look at that. You knew that was going to happen. Lack of concentration. Yeah, obviously. We are so bad at concentrating. Okay, they talk about how, you know, attention deficit disorder and all that's really big in schools. It's big everywhere. We suck. We can't, like, think of one thing for longer than a few seconds. We've got all this stuff, music and TV, everything distracting us all the time. Concentration is focusing the mind on only one thought or subject without the mind wandering or thinking of anything else. Okay? If you're wondering what the noise is, if you're thinking it's too hot, if you're wondering what time it is, you're not concentrating. Okay? Think of the analogy I used earlier about the Chinese master with the mantra Wu. You could be able to sit in the middle of a thunderstorm in your backyard, being eaten alive by mosquitoes, and be able to concentrate. That's the goal. Okay? Um, obviously, that takes a lot of practice. But in the end, if the only time you can concentrate is in your bedroom with you know, headphones on, that's great. Work with whatever you have, with the idea being that you can work up to something much greater later on. If you can't concentrate, nothing happens. It's one of those sad facts of life. If you can't concentrate, you'll feel better after the practice, because you've been breathing deep, so you've been relaxed. Your mind's probably been distracted from a lot of worries and stresses, so your blood pressure will be low. You'll feel better about yourself. But as far as accessing the esoteric side of meditation, 
you're, you're not going to progress very far if you can't concentrate. Okay? And sometimes, you know what? Sometimes it's easy, sometimes it's hard. I've been doing this, uh, I've been doing Gnosis now for a little over eight years, but various aspects of meditation since probably I was about 15 or 16. Um, and still, there's sometimes that I decide to meditate, I'm going to meditate tonight or whatever, and I go into my meditation room and I sit down, and I'm like, you know what, it's not going to happen. That one thing is bugging me, I really got to deal with that, I got to go make that phone call or whatever. Okay, so you're not always going to be the master of meditation. There's sometimes different times of the year will influence it. Different phases of the moon can influence it. There's all kinds of things that can influence your state of mind and state of concentration. You have to get a sense of when that is for yourself. What times make it easy and what times make it hard. Okay, but you have to focus on the concentration. If you're not concentrating, you're just sitting in a chair. It's, you're not really going anywhere. Okay, and unfortunately, you can fool yourself into thinking you're making any progress when you're really not. You have to dominate the mind. Think of Jesus riding that donkey in a Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. We've got to take control of our own donkey, our crazy mind. We have to dominate it if we wish to enter into the higher dimensions. If our mind is flying anywhere, or flying all over the place, you don't get the benefits. Okay? If we aren't concentrating, then there's an expression, you're doing it mechanically. You're simply going through the motions. You know what's mechanical? The ego. And you can fool yourself into doing a regular meditation every half, you know, every night for half an hour, which is simply an exercise for the ego. It's just going through the motions. I'll sit down, I'll go, oh, or make whatever sound or whatever chant while I'm thinking about work tomorrow. Okay, that's purely an exercise of the ego, and you're not making any process. Okay, I know you're so sick of hearing me talk about concentration, but that's the obstacle. Everything else, um, to quote Master Sam Al, is as easy as drinking a glass of water. Once you learn to concentrate, this is the obstacle you have to overcome. Everything else is easier after that. Everything, whether it's after projection, working with past lives, developing chakras, whatever. It's all easy once you dominate the mind, because the mind is the obstacle. Our mind is the prison that we have to break out of. Concentration shuts off all thoughts, but one which leads to that state of meditation or non-thinking. Remember that picture I showed you last week? If you do not get there, nothing will happen. You can't get from you know, your regular state of mind directly into higher dimensions. You have to go through the bridge of concentration. Okay, You have to practice concentration, but the good news is you can practice it any time you want to, no matter what you are doing. That's the neat thing about concentration. To practice concentration, you don't have to be in a room by yourself with a cement sense and a candle in the dark corner of your house or something like that. You can meditate anyway. You could be concentrating right now. You could be concentrating at work. If you properly understand how to work with concentration, every single thing that you do is a meditation. Okay? You can be doing the dishes and working on concentration. How? By doing the damn dishes and nothing else. You can be driving to work focusing on concentration. Okay. You can be tying your shoes, developing concentration. Okay, so concentration doesn't just have to be something we do in a meditation, it can be something that we do 10, 20 times a day. Okay, you can pick an activity. Okay, same thing as self-observation, whenever you're washing the dishes, going to the bathroom, eating food, tying your shoes, whatever, and say for the next few minutes, this is all I'm going to do and resist any other thought coming into your mind. So you're standing there washing the dishes, and I mean go, I'm taking the plate, I'm scrubbing it, I'm rinsing it, I'm putting it in the drying rack, I'm taking this bowl, I'm scrubbing it, and it sounds goofy, but you're developing awareness. You're flexing the muscle of your consciousness by staying in the present moment. Because normally how you wash dishes is, oh, what am I going to do work tomorrow? I'm going to do that thing, and then this weekend is going to be, and your hands are just doing its own thing. And sometimes to the point where you drop something or smash something that pulls you out of it, and you go, whoa, I didn't even... I wasn't even aware to you know, smash that dish against the other one. And if everybody practiced concentration when they were driving, we'd all be paying $20 a year insurance and there'd be no car accidents. Okay, but there's so many car accidents because people are in the car, but their mind is somewhere else. And we've all done it. You've all done this, right? You get home from work and you're like, whoa, what am I doing here so early? What happened in the last few minutes of that drive? You just weren't conscious for them. Yeah. It could be, but I'm probably going to think that there's a whole lot of uh, emotion and other stuff involved in that as well. If you could, uh, chess is a good one. If you can, and concentration is simply doing whatever you're focusing on without getting all emotion and stuff coming into play. So if you're playing a video game where you're running around and I don't know, you're shooting people, 
if you're able to say, I'm going here, I'm going there, and I've shot that person, but you're probably, oh, you're, yeah, oh, do it this way, yeah. And you've got all the emotion, the excitement. If you can <laughs> keep that down, then you're concentrating. Okay? Um, give it a go, but you, you probably have a hard time with that. Okay? That's why sometimes simple, mundane tasks, like washing the dishes, what else you do? you got to stand there anyway. There's nothing designed with washing dishes to stimulate any kind of emotion. Video games and movies and sports are... That's why we like them so much, because they're designed to generate that emotion, that interest. Vacuuming, cleaning your house, that sucks. But yeah. it's not very exciting. Yeah. That's a good thing to concentrate on. Yeah. Couldn't you be fully concentrated on like sports, like you know when you're in the zone, like and you're really in the moment with everything? Mm -hmm. and that, that yeah, way? that's one of the things why some athletes, um, really successful athletes, that's what they'll do, right? They'll drop, they'll describe what they do is, I don't know, I drop into some kind of zone and then I just, just see everything and sometimes some of them will say that they can see outside like the time, they can, anything, see they can see moves ahead. Like, yeah, everything happening and you're able to just, you know, that's, that's a different state of consciousness, right? It's yeah. a state of meditation. That's someone who's able to control all aspects of the emotional, intellectual, and motor center and actually do I that. I some athletes actually like getting, uh, uh, I heard some kind of gymnast and she would uh, dream about different moves she was actually going to perform. Mm -hmm. Or like have dreams about it and then she would actually try them the next day and like her mm -hmm. uh, performances and stuff like that. Yeah, these are people that are just they're accessing like, the higher dimensions. They just right. they don't really realize what they're doing. Yeah. So, you know, rather than Wayne Gretzky, you know, staring at the face of God and arriving at a state of peace, <laughs> the man can that. play a mean game of hockey. <laughs> okay, if that's what he wants, that's what he wants, right? But it's a it's similar, similar thing. Yeah. So yeah, you could drop into a, a zone like that. Mm -hmm. But whatever that means for you, just remember the in the proper state of concentration, there is no emotion. There is no other thoughts, right? It's just doing what you're doing, whether it be vacuuming or playing a video game or even into a sport. It's just that focused. How about gardening? Gardening? Could awesome. be. Yep, absolutely. Yep, weeding and all that kind of stuff, just right. getting right into that. But you have to remember, you gotta, it's just the task at hand, which means no emotion, which means no pleasure, which means no pain, which means no happiness, no sadness, just a pure... This is the task at hand. I am living in the moment. I'm here right now. I am weeding this patch of soil, and this is what I'm going to do. Yeah, anything can be an exercise to develop concentration, no matter where you are or what you're doing. Okay? So people often think, well, meditation, you know, I, I don't know, I don't really have a lot of time in the evening. I only have a space, and i got roommates, and it's difficult because my house is noisy. Well, you can meditate anytime. Okay, because developing concentration, no matter where you are at work, at home, you can be developing it. So if you did that during the day, and then you sat down in your home, in your space, and tried to mantra for half an hour, your concentration would be that much better, because it was already used to focusing on the vacuuming, or the video games, or the gardening, or the sports, or whatever it is that you wanted to do. Okay, so that's the key. We can be practicing concentration anytime we want. When we develop concentration, the other stuff's easy. Concentration is one of the big keys, but it's also the hugest obstacle. You have to have concentration, so it's the key, but getting concentration is the really hard part, so it becomes the obstacle. Okay, because without concentration, then we're focusing on the physical body. We want to move, shift, fidget, scratch an itch. We can hear the neighbor's dog. We can hear the cars on the street. We can hear the music. We can feel the temperature of the room. All this stuff shows lack of concentration. Okay, and it's yeah, you're sick of hearing me say it. It's practice. It really is practice. And if you get lost along the way, because sometimes you jump ahead in the practices and you really weren't quite weren't ready, but you jumped into a big mantra like Gate Gate, or you jumped into an astral projection exercise, and you're still not getting any results, sometimes bring it right back to the candle. Staring at the candle flame for 15 minutes and thinking nothing else except the candle flame. Okay, that's why that was the first exercise I think I showed you after the mm -hmm. complete breath. The first thing we looked at was the complete breath because you can't do anything without that. And the second exercise was staring at the candle and closing our eyes and trying to see the candle on the screen of our mind and holding that flame for as long as we can. Okay, five, ten minutes a day to start with that. Okay, don't beat yourself up. Don't say, I'm going to, I'm damn, I'm going to do this for 45 minutes. <laughs> if you're not ready for it, because it's just frustrating and it's annoying and you're going to not feel good, you're going to hate it, you're not going to want to do it. Just say, I've got 10 minutes, I've got 10 minutes, I'm going to try that candle thing again. And just try to concentrate and maybe the first, maybe you do it for 30 seconds and that was it. You're like, oh, you know, I think I did it there for 30 seconds, but okay. And then try the next day for 10 minutes and that 30 seconds becomes 34 seconds. And then it slowly develops over time, but you've got to try something, okay? So don't get too 
caught up with the complicated mantras, if you're still having a hard time concentrating, go back to the candle. Or your breathing. Just focus on nothing else but your breathing. Or the only thing you've done is your heart. Find your heartbeat and focus on nothing else but your heartbeat. Just for as long as you can, as long as it, and until you get frustrated or annoyed, and then simply stop. Don't push yourself too far. There's, uh, what is the quote? There's a difference between a mind that is silence and a mind, sorry, there's a difference between a mind that is in silence and a mind that has been silenced by violence. Violence being you, like beating on yourself, like forcing yourself to do it. There's a difference between those. A mind that just arrives at that state naturally, or one that's forced and beaten on until it gets into that state. Okay, so don't push yourself too hard. Time. Time is a huge obstacle. When meditating, we have to forget about time and live in the eternal instant. Stop keeping track of time. One of the things that we've talked about before is we know that right before in, in this room, we're seeing the three dimensions of length, width, and height, right? Through those three dimensions of length, width, and height flows the fourth dimension of time. Where we go when we meditate is the fifth dimension, which is outside of time. It's an existence that doesn't have time attached to it which is a strange concept to think about, but when we're meditating, we don't want to be too focused on time. And for some reason, when you start out, it's like time becomes your goal. Like, how long can you do it for? Five minutes, 10 minutes, 20 minutes, half an hour. You become obsessed with, how long have I been sitting here? My goal today was half an hour. Has it been half an hour yet? Has it been half an hour yet? How long has it been? It's probably been about, about three songs, songs about five, it's probably 15 minutes. Okay, you develop this weird obsession with time and how long it's been. Okay, that's another trick the ego plays with you. You want to stop keeping track of time. Okay, so we constantly focus on time. You've probably done that here. I wonder what time it is. I wonder when this is going to be done. I wonder how long we're going to do that for. These are time-related thoughts that come into your mind while you're practicing. Okay? You also try to set limits, such as I'm going to meditate for 30 minutes and then spend the whole time wondering if it's been 30 minutes yet. Okay, a good meditation, time disappears. Okay, last week was pretty good. We did a long one last week, and a lot of people say, I can't believe it was that long. It's like, aha, that means you're in the right zone. You had no idea what time it was. I've hinted at that after we've done a little bit more uh, classes and have some more practices down, you can come to our two-hour meditation night. Every Monday we do two hours, and you're thinking, two hours? You'd be surprised how fast two hours goes if you're able to be in the right frame of mind, okay, which is outside of time. Okay, I've done some of those two-hour meditations where I just could get into it, and it's like, oh boy, I got two hours of trying to pretend that I can meditate now. This is not going to be a good night. It's just you've got to be able to get outside the concept of time. How can you experience that which is beyond time if you're constantly aware of how long it has been? You're trying to break free from time and exist in a dimension that's outside of time. If you are focused on the time, you are grabbing onto that dimension and staying in it. Just like if we don't relax the physical body, how are we supposed to experience existence outside the physical body while we're constantly wondering, is my foot falling asleep? Gee, my shoulder's itchy. I gotta move my right leg. Okay, just like we have to break free from the physical body by not focusing on it, we have to break free from time as well by not focusing on it. Okay, so ideally if you're gonna meditate, kind of, it's nice if it can be an open-ended kind of thing where it's like, I'm just gonna do this and I'm gonna stop and I'm gonna stop. I have a CD that I use, and at some point in the meditation, I'll realize the music is over. Like, oh, the music is done. It must be time for me to stop. I don't know exactly when the point where the music ended, but I kind of use that as a cue. You can try something like that yourself. Worst case scenario, set an alarm. If, you have to, if you're afraid of going off and you know, I don't want to be late for work or something, set an alarm and say the alarm will take care of the time. I don't have to worry about that. Okay? But... Um, it's, it's funny because you keep track of time in this weird internal process. You've all done this before. You set the alarm for the next day, and you wake up like a minute before the alarm's supposed to go off. You're like, how the hell do I do that? Yeah. We've got this internal yeah. clock that we use, right? So you really have to break free from that. So time can become an obstacle. You can become too conscious of the elapse of time, and it prevents you from breaking outside of that dimension. This is a tough one. Fear sucks. The ego of fear must be comprehended or else it prevents us from reaching the higher levels. When we're finally breaking free of the ego, when we're finally breaking out of the prison of the mind, the ego has one last trump card it likes to use. 
and that trump card is fear. You know the horror movie scenario where the monster finally falls over the cliff, but the last minute that one hand comes up and grabs the guy by the ankle? That's the ego of fear. Okay, that's the ego going, ah, oh, I've lost, I'm done, ooh, but I've got one more trick. And it throws fear at you. And this can actually catch you by surprise. Um, sometimes the sensations associated with meditation, and especially as projection, they're kind of scary because um, they're not anything you've experienced before. I was quite surprised to discover the first time I had a really successful meditation, uh, it was met with a good dose of kind of like, what the hell is going on here? This is really weird. I don't think I like this. Just because it was new and novel and different. A lot of us sensations of astral projection can be quite scary. Okay, one of the famous ones of astral projection that's scary that you might have experienced is, you ever woke up in your bed completely paralyzed with something pushing down in your chest before? That's something that's associated with astral projection. That's been described in humanity for like thousands of years, going back to Chinese texts. Uh, this feeling of pressure on your chest and being able to, unable to move and just feeling like you're paralyzed or something wrong with you, that's related to astral projection, different states of consciousness. Okay, so sometimes fear could become a little bit of an obstacle. It can prevent us from reaching higher levels. When the egos are silenced and the essence is liberating itself, the sensation can sometimes feel a little bit like dying. A little bit like ceasing to exist, ceasing to be, losing our identity, becoming annihilated, merging with everything. The sensation of merging with everything can be quite profound, but at the beginning it feels like to merge into everything you have to lose who you are. Remembering that who you think you are right now is the false self. It's the ego. Okay, you might have heard the term ego death before. Okay, it's something similar happens in meditation. When you finally break free of this prison, this shell that you think you are, sometimes at the back of your mind is, I'm losing everything. I'm losing who I am. I'm losing the physical world. What, what about my job? What, what about my family? What about my kids? What, 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 what's happening here? Okay, sometimes that can generate that fear response. Not always, some people just can't wait for that to happen and it feels beautiful and liberating and all that kind of stuff, but sometimes along the way, this can happen. And I wasn't prepared for that. I didn't know that was gonna happen. And the next thing I know, I was like freaking out thinking that I was dying and losing my sense of self. and wondering if I was ever gonna be come back, if I were able to come back, okay? The way to get through the fear is to practice. Okay, because in the first couple of times I'd start meditating, or I'd meditate and I'd start having success, and I'd start having these different sensations, and it'd get out of me, and I'd come back to my physical body. I'd be like, whoa, that was creepy. There's like this light that started as a point, and was like slowly enveloping, and then all I could see was this brilliant light, and I closed my eyes, and I moved. I was like, what the hell was going on there? You broke the concentration, okay? But the next time that happened, I was like, okay, I remember this. Let's see where this goes. Let's stay with this a little bit longer. No, I still don't like that. I want to come back. I want to come back. Okay? Both practice, you go a little bit further each time until you start to look at some of the things that might have freaked you out. They become the signs for, yeah, I'm looking forward to this. This means it's working. This means I'm doing the right thing. Another one that kind of freaks you out, I talked a little bit about last week. Um, you know your meditation is starting to work when you start to lose awareness of your physical body. Your hands feel like they've gone numb. You're like, I can't, where are my feet? I can't feel my feet. I don't know what position my feet are in. You've got to like go with that. Okay, what your body wants to do is move or shift to reestablish that connection with your yeah. hands or your feet or something. Don't, because that means you've given up concentration, you've directed your attention back to your physical body, and the ego has won. Okay, but as you meditate, sometimes that, you know, I can't tell where my hands are, spreads into, I can't tell where my arms are, I can't tell where my body is, what the hell is going on? It can be kind of like, not fear is in making you really frightened, but disconcerting. A sensation that this isn't right, and I don't want to do this anymore. I want to change, I want to move, or, or do something like that to establish that connection. That's fear. You've got to get over that. The way we get over fear is practice. Okay? It's a learning experience. As, as humans, we're always afraid of that, which we don't know, right? Each time, we take a little step farther, we take a little step farther, we take a little step farther. Okay? But that's a practice thing. That's the only way you're going to overcome that fear is to practice and learn what the sensation you need. Learn the little steps along the way. Okay, many times some of the things that we see, some of the things that we feel, can trigger fear, which pulls the essence back into the bottle of the ego. Okay, I think I mentioned once uh, doing a meditation and hearing uh, somebody say my name right beside my ear. That scared the hell out of me. <laughs> at the time, and I was like, what the hell was that? Is there somebody in the room? And it wasn't until I realized that that is sometimes one of the side effects that happens. That's just your sense of uh, clear audience. 
the ability to hear in the higher dimensions active. Just like in a meditation, you can sometimes see things, see a vision or something like that for a second or two. Sometimes you hear something. You can hear a sound. Um, there's a lot of noises associated with uh, different states of consciousness. Uh, some of them are kind of just different. So that can trigger you to go back into your physical body. Think of it that way. Anytime you're f f feeling fear or hesitation or reservation, that's the trump card of the ego. If you give into that, it's one again. And that's, there's nothing worse than having a success in a practice only to lose it because of this. Yes? If you feel intense happiness, should you avoid that too? No. No, you can go with that one. Yeah, the peace, the contentment, the happiness. Yeah, that's, that's, that's part of the experience of the higher dimensions. It's just sometimes uh, that's kind of what everybody's. Ex I'm saying this because everyone kind of expects something like that to happen, but sometimes to their, you know, shock, that's a coming with a good dose of this, you know, like a big. Um, sometimes you see things. Like I said, the first really deep meditation experience I had ever was a point of light suddenly came into my consciousness, and I'm not saying this is what will happen either. Everybody's different, by the way, so this is not the way it's supposed to go. Um, and that point of light suddenly just started to expand, and it was really really bright and I couldn't see anything other than this really really bright light and it kept getting brighter and brighter and brighter and I was like the hell with this I opened my eyes and I was sitting back in my room and I was like okay I probably shouldn't have opened my eyes right now that was probably a good thing that was happening but at the time it wasn't like oh this is the most awesome thing ever it's working at the time I was like the hell is going on here <laughs> so and I have to learn to get through that point same thing with a lot of physical sensations with the body and, and what happens during meditation. If you're not prepared for it, sometimes this comes out of nowhere just to, to, to trip you up. So don't give in to the fear, just, just go with it. But fear is such a primal basic thing that you can't always control it. That's why the only thing that you can do to get around fear is um, practice. And then the next time that weird lighting happened, I was like, okay, this happened last time and nothing bad happened, so I'm going to go with it a bit further. Same thing with physical sensations. I remember this thing. Um, I'm going to keep going with this to see where this goes. But the first time that happens, it can, it can throw you for a loop. Doubt. Doubt is, doubt is an interesting one. Doubt is the one that comes when you're sitting in a chair, and you've been doing it for a while, and you're like... I just go back downstairs. This probably isn't doing anything. It's probably a waste of time. I'm probably better off doing my homework, or I'm probably better off vacuuming the house or something right now. Because I don't know. Maybe this meditation thing's not for me. I mean, maybe it's for other people because I don't. I probably can't do this. I'm probably not good enough. You probably have to like do this like 20 hours a day. I really don't have that kind of time. And I don't know. I don't know if this is even for me. That's how doubt works. Okay. Uh, you have to dissect doubt to see what other impulse it hides. Why do you not think you can do it? There's plenty of documentation about different states of consciousness in meditation. There's plenty of people that you can talk to that say, yes, meditation is real. Yes, that's rejection is real. Yes, the higher dimensions are real. Okay, so they're there. Why is it that you don't think you can get there? What's the problem here? Okay, and you have to arrive at that conclusion for yourself. It could sometimes be related to things like fear or, or sometimes it's related to things like self-esteem, but you have to really have a good look at why that happens. Because with some people, this becomes a huge obstacle. And I've talked to people that have said, yeah, well, you know, that's probably for people like you that have, like, you know, all this experience and stuff. I don't know. I've tried a few times. I don't think I can do this. Well, why not? What's the difference between me and you? Nothing. We both have the same kind of mind, the same kind of body, same kind of consciousness, built out of the same materials. I have egos. You have egos. Um, I've tried some stuff maybe a bit longer than you, but that doesn't necessarily mean anything. I've seen students that have astral projected in, like, a matter of weeks where it took me a matter of almost, um, got to get a good, decent, like, astral rejection experience. It was, it was quite a while, probably almost a year. But I've seen people that have done it after a couple of weeks. So just because I've done it for longer doesn't just mean anything. You can, be, you can be way better at meditation than me after three weeks of trying. This is the way it is. Willpower sometimes gets... Yeah. You don't have the willpower or the tenacity mm -hmm. or people who are oh, it takes, it's too hard. This, this is what erodes that, you right? Know. This is what erodes that yeah. willpower and the tenacity because what's the point? It's not going to work. I don't have enough kind of time. But if they don't have it to begin with, mm -hmm. very much of it, you know, and the doubt, you put the doubt in, mm -hmm. then it really defeats everything. Mm -hmm. Yep, yeah. yeah, that's a big problem. And you have to really get through that because it becomes a huge obstacle because it prevents you from trying. <coughs> Remember that if you're running with doubts, you've identified with the mind. That means you've identified with an ego, which means you're not concentrating. 
Okay, so that's what they're doubting. <laughs> ah, this isn't working. We should just go back downstairs. It's probably been too long. This is not going to happen. It's not going to happen tonight. It, it, why don't you do something else? Maybe it's maybe do it tomorrow. Yeah, tomorrow. Tomorrow, okay. I'll stop tonight because man, I'm going to try twice as hard tomorrow. I'm going to really give it tomorrow, but I'm going to stop tonight. Okay, that's just what you do, right? That's part of the game. Um, you, have to, you have to get away from that. So it's, think of it as exercising. You know, working out, losing weight. It's like, oh, other people can do it. I can't. I don't have the willpower. I don't have the time. I can't work out. I, it's the same thing. Other people, you know, can do it because they put the effort into it. Everybody who tries to meditate will be successful if they try properly. Okay? That's, that's the way it works. Eliminate doubt through analysis and discover the underlying truth. And many times you can discover that um, fear can be behind yeah. doubt. It's a fear of the unknown. Um, fear of through, through this, just through the years, all the different mm -hmm. students that I've had, um, there's two reasons why people leave the studies. There's two people why, reasons why people leave the path and, and, and don't stick around. Reason number one is because they give up. They just didn't have the willpower or the perseverance or the tenacity to stay with it. There's another reason why people sometimes leave and don't come back, because it works. And they're not prepared for that. My favorite story uh, uh, about this is there was a couple that used to come uh, a few years ago. And she was obviously quite into the studies. And he was obviously the boyfriend or husband that had been dragged along and totally didn't want to be here. The guy kind of sat in the back with his arms crossed with his head to the side like, this is so lame. And every time he, I looked at him, he kind of rolled his eyes like, whatever, buddy. You know, he had this whole vibe of, I don't want to be here, and this is all a bunch of crap, but I've got to come here because my girlfriend's making me, and I said we'd do things together, or whatever the backstory was. <laughs> <laughs> he totally had that vibe of, like, I'm here because I, you know, I did something I shouldn't have, and I was supposed to do things together, and she's into this new age crap, and yeah, yeah, whatever. <laughs> but this guy was doing the techniques because there was no, nothing else to do, especially for the meditations. And we did this one exercise for astral projection. It happens to be one of my favorite ones because it's a really powerful one. And it's, it's designed um, to work with some chakras that um, people have trouble with uh, for astral projection. And it's also, um, it has an accompanying visualization which makes it a really powerful exercise. Well, if everybody in that room, guess who it worked for? <laughs> that yeah. guy came out of the meditation, he was like, I can't, I can't believe that happened. Like I was there, I was able to reach down and pick up the sand and I could see it, I could see He was like totally blown away. Never saw him or the girl again. <laughs> because if you weren't ready for it, that means you now have to redefine everything you think you know about reality, your life, and your place in the universe. And some yeah. people just aren't ready for that. Yeah. Maybe because he had no expectations. You know what? I always wondered that because the guy was like, he was free of ambition, free of results, wasn't hearing all those things listed earlier. He was just like, oh, I'll sit down here and do this thing and think about this thing, yeah, whatever, yeah, whatever. Boom, the guy was there. And when we were done, we came out of it, he was kind of standing there shaking his head, and he was just like, I can't believe that. And he was like totally blown away, and everybody was so uber excited. He was talking and talking about, and I never saw him with a girl again. And that happens sometimes, right? It just was too much, there's too much fear associated with that. There's too much kind of. You know, what, what does that mean for the rest of the rest of your life and, and the universe and everything I thought was, you know, I thought, I thought, this is how life reality was and I've discovered that it's not that way and it's not that way. So sometimes that can be a problem and that can oftentimes get back to fear. Fear of having to, you know, acknowledge a lot of these things and that's where doubt can come in as well. Importance of meditation. Meditation is the key. You have to persevere. When one has really had a mystical experience, nothing can stop yearning for liberation. As I mentioned earlier, you guys are in the catch-22 position. I call it the catch-22 because you really haven't had any concrete experiences, so you don't really have a lot to draw on, so it's really easy to go, I don't know if this is really for me, I don't know if I want to meditate anything tonight, I'm kind of tired. When you've had an experience, everything changes because now you know what you're after. Right? Once you've had one experience in meditation or one experience with astral projection or something like that, or you're remembering an aspect of your past lives, then you're like, yeah, I, I, want, I want more. This is real. I can do this. I, I really want to go after this now. But you're in the stage where, um, or you might be in the stage, sorry, where you're kind of like just going on face value of like, okay, this guy said this will work. I'll try it. I don't really know. And that's a hard position to be in because nothing's really fueling that desire. Once you've had a mystical experience, then nothing can stop you. And like, wait a second. If this is for real, then this means all these things are for real, then I have to know. 
I have to know, I have to experience this for myself. And then you've got something to drive that yearning, you've got something to, to make your, to reach for that goal. But right now the goal's kind of vague and hazy for you, you're kind of going on. I've heard there's other dimensions and I think I can reach this different state of consciousness, but I don't really know. That's the, the, the position that you're in. Through experiences, we draw the strength to persevere in the work. If you're here, it's probably because you are like-minded. You've been thinking about this kind of stuff your entire life, probably. You've always known that there was more to life than, you know, 9 to 5, Monday to Friday, work, play, home, get a house, get a car, roll, die, leave somebody a bunch of money. Okay, you've probably always known that there's something more to what you see with your eyes every day. Okay? It's through experiences that you draw strength to persevere. You have to take that knowledge and now put it into action. Remembering, like I've said this quote a bunch of times, one of the things Master Sonal is famous for, it is better to do one hour of practice than read a hundred books on esoteric subjects. Because you can read until you're blue in the face. In, the, in my earlier days, that's what I did. I amassed a massive book collection. I spent insane amounts of money tracing down individual books that were published in like the 1700s because they might have the answers. And I read book after book after book and spent crazy amounts of money and never found the answer in any damn page anywhere. Okay, and now, you know, I found the Gnostic path because I'd had kind of interest in this stuff and that was what really introduced me to practicing and it was through practicing that I got an experience. The books didn't help at all gave me a bunch of intellectual knowledge. I could quote all kinds of things and talk about what Cornelius Agrippa wrote in, in 1568, that, well, whatever. Okay, it wasn't until that I actually practiced that I got somewhere. And I, I don't like to think it was wasted, but I wasted a lot of time. I wasted a good, um, probably almost 10 years of really wanting to know, really wanting to be on this path, really trying to work, but I thought it was going to be in a book. Or on a web page, a web page somewhere. Sorry. If you waste a lifetime doing that. Yeah, you can waste a whole lifetime doing that. I figured it was going to be the secret was in some book, or mm -hmm. I had to meet the right person who would tell me mm -hmm. the secrets. I didn't realize it was all inside. I just had to get to them. In order to get to them, I had to practice. In order to practice, I had to have the perseverance. But yes. Sometimes books can guide you to yep. a certain way of thinking yep. and then you start discovering things yeah, in Yeah, absolutely, but there's always going to be a practical side. component. It's, they they complement each other. You can't have, you know, the books don't work unless the practice is there. If you cut the practice out, then you've just got oh, a yeah. bunch of intellectual yes, yes. knowledge. Yeah, I'm not, yeah, I'm not saying, yeah, I, don't, I don't read any books. I'm saying you got a choice between tonight, you got an hour. You're going to read a book, or you're going to practice. The choice is you're going you're gonna to practice. Because the practice will lead somewhere, the book yeah. might, at some point, direct you in some particular path. But yeah, absolutely. But the thing is, it's, it's the practice, that's the big one. Through experience, we can directly experience what is real, the truth. Okay? Uh, call it God, call it Brahma, call it Allah, call it Krishna, call it Jehovah, call it whatever the hell you want to call it. It's all the same damn thing. It's the truth, the source of all things. That's something that can only be experienced it can never be taught, it can never be told, it can never be shown. That's why when the disciples asked Jesus, Jesus, tell us what is the truth, he turned and walked away. When the Buddha's disciples asked Buddha, Master, show us the truth, he just stood there staring at them. That's the story. You can't be told it, you can't be shown it. Yeah. you got to explain it for yourself. Yes? Uh, Jiddu Krishna Maradi, I he says it's like truth is a pathless, uh, pathless. Truth is pathless. Yeah. There's no path you can follow to truth. No. Yeah, there's no, there's no map, there's no arrow, there's nothing. It's, it's something that you have to arrive at yourself. Yeah. And that's, that's the challenge. And that's, we don't want to do that though. Can I just somebody tell me, like now, because it would really make life easier if you could like tell me or give me the book you read that had it in or whatever. <laughs> it's, it's not the same. So again, we have to experience that. And that's, that's the challenge. In the beginning, we occasionally perceive fleeting images during meditation. Later, we perceive all the images of the superior worlds. Okay, in the beginning, you get little bits and pieces. You maybe get to see a vision or a symbol or see something or have an answer to a question or a word or an image pop in your mind. And then over time, those images and scenes gradually transform into you being fully immersed in the higher dimensions. Remember that graph I drew last week that had little breaks in the arrows? As eventually those breaks get bigger and bigger, that's what we're talking about here. 
Okay, so it is a learning, even the process of meditation is a learning process. Okay, it's like, you know, planting an acorn and getting an oak tree. It's a slow, gradual process. It's not an automatic, suddenly the universe is yours in one meditation. Each time you go a little bit farther, you learn a little bit more, you go a little bit deeper. Okay, it gradually develops over time. In the beginning, you see neat little images and things like that, but over time, that changes. Over time, you eventually perceive all the images of the superior worlds. Okay? And remember, we've all heard the exp uh, expression, when the student is ready, the teacher appears. It's probably not going to be a physical one that you find. Okay? It's not a physical teacher that you encounter. Most of the teachers of humanity, they're in the higher dimensions. That's where they are. Because once you get there, then you've done the necessary prep work, and they know that uh, you're ready. So I know that's a, a quote that a lot of people, you know, think about, and they're waiting to meet that one person. Well, probably not going to meet that person. I'm not that person. That person's waiting for you. You just got to go to them, and they're not in the physical. Any questions about that? Okay, let's. Uh, yo. I have one. What uh, was? Right at the end of the lecture, you showed us uh, it is not the mind, it is not the Buddha, it is nothing. Yes. Can you spend a bit more? Um, I know. Can you? Can I give it to you in a way that your rational consciousness will understand? That no. Message? No. Uh, what about that? How are we supposed to think about that? Um, well, what that? is it then? Solve it. It's not the mind. It's not the Buddha. It is nothing. Well, what is it? Think about it. Okay. It takes some time. Yeah. 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 And that's the exact thing, you're looking at it going, what the hell kind of nonsense yeah. is that? That's mm -hmm. awesome, that's your intellect going, I don't know what that is. But take that into meditation and run that over, solve it. It, it doesn't answer, it's something, but what is it? It's not the mind, it's not the Buddha, it's not. So what is it then? Okay, and it's literally bringing the meditation, and that's the focus of that meditation. Think nothing else but that riddle until you get the answer. <laughs> Go, cool, let's take a five minute break and then we'll come back and do our meditation.